Pat, how are you? I'm good, Kev. I'm happy to be doing this. Your, your podcast is one of my favorite podcasts, genuinely. <laughs> you and Rogan, and there's a friend of mine, Raspberry Ape Podcast. It's a jiu-jitsu podcast in London. So, Thank you. It's good to be here. That, me that means a lot, Pat. Um, as I mentioned, I'm a fan. My mother's a fan. <laughs> <laughs> I, get, I get that a bit. <laughs> <laughs> Shout out to Mrs. Ball. Um, because how, how I first heard about you was when I was made redundant for my job, I was I was thinking, I don't know what, what I'm going to do now. I, I have no clue. And I was teaching my sister, I think I think we like to do plank or something like this. And because uh, I was basically in between jobs, I thought, I don't know. I, I was a bit shell shocked. And my sister said, you know, you could do this for a living. And I just thought, I, th I never even thought about it. And then my mum says, oh, well, you're watching The Late Late. Yeah. <laughs> and there was this, and my sister chimed in and said, yeah, there was this ch guy on uh, called Pat DeVille. And he is, uh, was a personal trainer. He opened his own gym and he had these struggles where he was doing boot camps on the beach. And uh, now he's writing a book and he's, uh, and, and says, you, you, could, you could do that. So that was my, my first introduction to you. Yeah. And then I, I started watching your stuff on YouTube. Um, so thank you for the inspiration. Thank you. <laughs> Here's a funny one with the Late Late Show. I, uh, my background story of failing with my first business in Dublin, I've told that story a million times. But when I failed, I came back to Galway and um, tail between my legs, I was really embarrassed and ashamed of the fact that I'd failed because some of the papers sold me as a rags to riches story. Mm. And the reality was I'd always been given everything I ever needed in terms of education and opportunity through my parents. And so when I failed and I came back with my tail between my legs at 24 and moved back in with them, I was ashamed. And so I'd bump into their friends all the time, um, uh, you know, my friend's parents. And they'd be telling me, you know, my kid's in Australia, my kid's gone back to college, my, and I just felt such shame and such, it was horrible. And for some reason, I pinned it in my head that if I get the Late Late Show someday, I'll have made it. Because if you're Irish and you get the Late Late Show, <laughs> you've done something. So I spent the next six years telling everybody who'll listen, and anyone who, di who didn't want to listen, I'm going to be on the Late Late Show. And people would be like, when? And I'm like, I don't know, but soon. Hmm. And so I got a phone call a couple of years later and they're like, we want to have you on. And I was like, yes, it's happened. I've, I've talked it into reality. And so I announced on Facebook, I'm on the Late Late Show on Friday. And everyone's like, amazing. You know, you said this for years. And then they ring me the next day and they're like, Richard Gear is actually over. <laughs> We're going to have to reschedule and put someone else on. So that Friday, I'm walking around Galway and there's like random strangers shouting at me. They're like, good luck tonight, Pat. And I'm just like, oh, crap. <laughs> Luckily, they got me on the following week. But yeah, that introduced a lot of people to what I was doing, I think. Yeah. So, Richard, if you're listening, you, you bump Pat out of the way. You never know. Um, yeah, man, but it happened. And it, were, you, were you nervous? Yeah, I look back and um, I look back at a lot of stuff from years ago. And I've told you I'm an introvert by nature. And growing an online business let me hide behind a camera and kind of portray an image of being outgoing and all these things. But then when the online business got big and you've got to go to real events and talk to real people, that was definitely a challenge for me. Mm. Um, I look back and I was, I feel like I was shy. Um, I got lovely feedback and people were like, oh, he's genuine and it's amazing to see him do well, all this kind of stuff. But I remember that night, you know, it, it's the whole negativity bias thing. I'm driving back to Galway. My parents are driving me home, thousands of lovely messages and I was inundated. There'd be one or two bad ones. Like, this guy's got no charisma. What is he doing on the telly? I'm like, oh, I've got oh, no charisma. Harsh, and they're like, all this positive. And like, one guy, this guy's got no charisma. I'm like, ah, oh, shit. <laughs> pack it in. He's right. I've got no charisma. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I, I was shy for sure. I was, I was nervous for sure. I thought about that for so long. Now, if I did it again in the morning, I'd stroll through it and I, I'd, I'd be happy out. But uh mm. But don't you think, Pat, that that is part of, well, I think anyway, is part of your charm. A bit like Jerry Duffy. When I went to Jerry's speaker school before Christmas, I'm watching him and thinking to myself, it's clear that he's really grafted at this. You know, he's, and he's, and I think also as well, as he said, when he did his public speaking, he said the first time he did public speaking, it was to just four people. But he felt so elated afterwards 
because he did, he probably didn't view himself as that type of person. He wasn't capable of that. Mm. And then that he did it, he thought, wow, I can share this with other people. And if you're learning off someone like that, it's, I think, way more inspiring than it's someone who it comes easy to. Yeah. It, like, because it, sh- it shows you that they have actually put together some practices and principles that they can then teach. And also, I think Jerry does an amazing job of empathizing with people. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's funny. When I was halfway through the speaker school with him, he said, write down your reflections of the day. What have you learned? And everyone was writing what they learned about themselves, and and which is probably what Jerry wanted. But my, I wrote down what I noticed about Jerry. Mm. <laughs> I said, Jerry, I noticed you you say hello to everyone. You make sure everyone's been looked after. You uh, go out of your way to help people. And that is, especially when you're in an environment where you've got public speak. And I was so nervous, Pat. That surprised me. I, I would see you as being comfortable. But then again, people say the same to me. So it's funny. We, we see ourselves very differently to how everyone else sees <laughs> yeah. mm. I, I think, though, Pat, I, I, because I expected myself to be confident, I was shocked how nervous I was. Yeah. So it was getting, getting around to me. OK, Kevin, you're next. And when I got up to speak, I, I just was all over the shop. To be, to be honest mm. and um, but I, I needed that because I needed to realize that you there's there's a skill in in public speaking it, sometimes people will say oh I'm I got the gift of the gab so I should be a yoga teacher or I should be a public speaker but yeah. it doesn't necessarily mean you're a good communicator no um funnily I would find it much more difficult presenting to a group of 10 people introducing myself than I would speaking to a thousand people having something to present. Like if I know what I'm trying to present, I know what I'm there for, I'm good. And I'm good one-to-one, but small groups, networking events, all that kind of stuff. I just, I'm not sure where to stand. I'm not sure where to put my hands <laughs> still. I just don't know. Like I went, I spoke this morning at an event. They said, hey, can you turn up early and network? I said, I, I can, but I'm not very good at networking. I'm not being ignorant. I'm just not very good at that. Yeah. Um, I did the yoga teacher training in December and we sit in the circle on the first day and we've got to introduce ourselves and I'm a public speaker, but my voice is shaking. Not because I'm nervous of the yoga, I just, I just find it awkward to, to introduce myself in a small group. But kind of tying in with what you're saying, the yoga teacher that was teaching us yeah. um, said that same thing to us. She said, I can do the splits. I've been able to do the splits since I was a kid. And so for me, it's difficult to understand someone who can't do the splits. But she said, for me, back bends have always been a huge struggle. Mm-hmm. I had to put years into learning back bends. But she said, because of that, I feel really, really confident in my ability now to, te- to teach back bends. So again, mm-hmm. when you have to learn it yourself, you do definitely become a better teacher. Yeah, absolutely, Pat. When I was, and I want to ask you about your, your teacher training, and, but, but when I was on my teacher training, my 200 hour, I was so self-conscious that I couldn't sit cross-legged. Yeah. everyone just sitting and then the ki- the teacher would say the trainer everyone just take a seat a comfortable seat i would think all right where's the chair yeah exactly oh yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. i'm glad there was someone else in the same boat <laughs> and then uh, uh, every time i was at teacher training i'm thinking how the hell can i be a yoga teacher i can't even sit on the floor what i realized as you were just saying is that can be then your superpower your secret weapon mm-hmm. because you know how what it feels like and if someone can sit cross-legged or if, even in full lotus pose with the um, with the feet on top of the thighs, I'll say to myself, you can sit how I'm sitting or you can sit how Mary's sitting at the front of the class there who's got her you know, legs over, it, over here. Um, so tell me about your teacher training because I did mine in Stony Batter. Okay. <laughs> you, went, you took it up or not? She went to... Uh, Co- Copenhagen. Copenhagen. Yeah. Now, I was there myself, but... Um, it's it was a, a spiritual experience, but in a different way. It's a, it's a, it's a mental place, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. um, I've been telling this story since I've come home in terms of like just what success is to me, and what, you know, how people define success and failure. Um, we arrive on the first day, we sit in a circle like you. I feel like a guy that's had two double hip replacements and I've been sat on the floor for five <laughs> minutes and I'm just like, how am I going to do this 12 hours a day? Goes around the circle. I've been practicing for five years. I've been practicing for two years. I'm 20 years. Gets to me. I'm like, I've done two yoga classes. <laughs> I really didn't enjoy them, but I think there's something to this. There's a lot of people that I respect that do yoga. So I want to kind of get a feel for it. I'll do my 200 hours. And at the end, I'll know if this is something I'm going to continue or if it's something that's just not for me. Mm. And everyone's looking at me like I'm crazy. And so I get my imposter syndrome, my self-doubt. I go through all these experiences. They told us that at the start, it's going to be an emotional roller coaster. 
And I threw my eyes up to heaven. I said, I've climbed some of the biggest mountains in the world. I do jiu-jitsu six days a week. I do my breath work. I've struggled with anxiety. I'll be fine. And then day four, I'm like, fuck this. I'm, gonna go home. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not able to do this. And day 10, I'm like, why am I not flexible? And like, I have to remind myself, I lifted weights from 14 to 24. 10 days of yoga is not going to turn that around. Mm. But how I would define my philosophy of life overall is week two we have to teach our first class 45 minute class and there's a girl before me teaching and mm -hmm. then i'm teaching and she's been doing yoga for five years mm -hmm. and she turns to me and she's real blunt she's like you were remarkably confident for a man who can't touch his toes <laughs> <laughs> <Just like. laughs> and i looked at her and i said i have no reason not to be confident i said i've never done this and so by doing it i'm winning because mm -hmm. me doing this is worth, I say an, a, an ounce of action is worth a ton of thinking about doing something. I've been 10 years thinking about trying yoga. Now I'm teaching a class. I'm like, this is success. Mm -hmm. Is this not success? I said, I'm going to see it as a failure if I'm comparing myself to you or to someone who's a million steps ahead of me. But as far as I'm concerned, if I'm a little bit better than I was the day before at anything, I'm successful. Mm -hmm. And I think that slight, that understanding, I think, can change people's lives because everyone's comparing themselves to other people. So yeah, I, I, I inched my way through the 200 hours, had an amazing experience, didn't get what I thought I'd get, which is probably a common thing, but I got lots more. So what I, did you think you would get? I think I probably thought I'd come back being able to do the bridge and the wheel. Oh, okay. I didn't know what they were. <laughs> I didn't know what they were. I thought, I'd, I thought you know, uh, I do a lot of jiu-jitsu. Jiu it's hard to pass my guard. I was like, it's going to be even harder to pass my guard because I'm going to have such hip mobility. I don't think my flexibility improved at all. There was one day I did a downward dog and the whole class gave me a standing ovation <laughs> because, <laughs> because it was so bad on day one. Um, but I had some of the deepest meditations I've had. I, I didn't understand like that the power of movement before your Shavasana. Um, I was the king of Shavasana out there. I was very good at that. One day some girl tried to adjust my hands when I was doing Shavasana. I was like, get away from me. <laughs> my time. Um, I thought it was interesting to learn the philosophy of yoga and it obviously ties in with a lot of the stuff I've learned over the years from different paths. Um, just meeting people from all over the world and, and, you know, spending a month with such a diverse group was amazing. Mm. There was loads of valuable lessons in there. And again, I think that's important for people to recognize. Sometimes you don't get the exact goal that you thought you wanted, mm. but you get a million other things. And you're going to feel like a failure if you're obsessed by the goal and you can't see the other magic. Mm. So I always try to kind of find the hidden wins, I would call them. Mm. The analogy or the example of that was when I had the gym years ago. You'd have a client come in on a Friday. You'd say, how are you feeling? They say, I feel amazing. My energy's high. I feel confident. First time doing a push-up this week. Ran around the block and didn't get out of breath. And, you know, I just feel good. I'm sleeping well. And then they would step on the scales and their goal for the week was to lose four pounds and they've lost three. And suddenly all those hidden wins disappear because they're so obsessed with how it's supposed to be. Mm. So I think we have to train ourselves to like widen the perspective in everything. Mm. You've got expectations on yourself as to where you should be. You miss out on a lot of that magic that's there as well, you know? Yeah, it's a funny one because while it's good to hold yourself accountable, have expectations, it can really destroy your progress or your productivity when you don't meet those expectations and how you react to that perfect example sunday i spent my whole sunday pat trying to fix the monitor on my computer screen and i thought my whole sunday would be um i, I thought i'd be a lot more productive but what i realized was that um, I had all these things written down once a day, but I had to get this thing done first before the other things happen. And honestly, it took me, a, 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 um, I was so frustrated because my I didn't meet my expectations. Yeah. But, but then what good does it do you to, to moan about it? And I was, I was all stroppy Sunday night. Yeah. You can ask Rach, <laughs> I was so stroppy. Um, but it's a difficult one because when you're working for yourself, like I don't have a direct boss as it were, you don't, you're trying to set your own daily goals, sure. your weekly goals. And it's hard to know what is, what's to be expected from you and how to, to keep going. Um, how do you keep going? I mean, cause you motivate a lot of people, but mm. how do you keep going? Cause you're doing, you do so much, man. Yeah. Um, 
in terms of expectations, I suppose the biggest thing with expectations, don't expect results for work you didn't do. That's probably my philosophy. Don't expect results for work you didn't do. In other words, if I do a month of yoga and I get a little bit more flexible and I feel a little bit more at peace and I'm kind of on top of things and I'm happy with that, and then I come back to Ireland and I don't do yoga for a week or two and I don't feel as good, there's no point in me beating myself up and stressing and blaming other people or shaming myself and be like, oh, you know, I'm not where I should be and this is not fair, whatever it is. No point blaming. That's the two things we tend to do is either blame other people or circumstances or we shame ourselves and we're like, I'm such a bad person because I didn't do my yoga practice. Mm. Neither of those serve you. So it's this idea of what did I do? Okay, cause and effect. Now that might seem quite clinical, but I didn't practice yoga. I don't feel as good mentally. What do I need to do? If I want to feel better mentally, I go and practice my yoga. So I'm a little bit like that. My expectation is I will get the results based on what I do. Mm. Um, And so with that in mind, you've got to be aware of what's in your control versus what's not in your control. So Mm. when it comes to setting goals or it comes to, I guess it's not in your control whether or not you're going to be able to fix the the monitor, uh, maybe. But maybe it isn't in your control to say, I'm going to spend an hour trying to do this. And if I don't get it done in the hour, maybe I'll get some... Mm. As soon as you said fixing a monitor, I was like, delegate that. Delegate I that. Know. I could not be doing that. I know, but I, I, I had, then I was so determined what I need, need to get this done. And I actually got it done in the end, which is the, so the happy end to the story, but it just took <laughs> way longer than, than to be expected. Um, Pat, do you know, when I before we did this podcast, I put out uh, a thing on Instagram to say, ask Pat any questions. I had the most questions I've ever had. Cool. So I, I don't want to, once a couple of weeks ago, I completely forgot to ask the guests the questions. <laughs> so I'm going to start asking the yes. questions now. It's not just about Here we me go. asking questions. So I go off on all sorts of tangents and I take different angles to questions. So <laughs> hopefully I'll be succinct with my answers. Okay. All right, here's a good one. This is quite a, there's a bit of a backstory here. Okay. So I'm going to do it. I've been teaching yoga for five years. It was my dream to leave my corporate job and share yoga with people but I feel like I'm losing my passion for it. I teach 12 public classes a week and I'm thinking about getting a part-time admin job to supplement my income, but I feel like this is giving up. How do I motivate myself? Ooh, <laughs> yeah, that is a good one. It's chal- yeah, look, it's challenging. My passion was always fitness and I found the same thing. You know, when I, when I opened a gym, suddenly you go from being uh, an advocate of fitness to being a business owner and a marketeer and a salesperson and the person that's collecting, what would you call that person? The debt collector. <laughs> You're all these different things. So it is difficult and you can lose the passion. Um, I would possibly identify where the area is that you're frustrated with your current position. Okay. So I might say I'm frustrated with I'm not getting paid enough. Um, I've got to invoice all these places. Um, the venue is charging me too much. Uh, I don't have consistent. I would try to come up with what are the current problems, and then I would look at can I find prescriptions. Um, so if I was to look back on my gym days, the biggest problem for me when I had my gym was the biggest stressor was people were not paying on time, and I didn't have an efficient system for collecting payments. That caused 90% of my stress in my mind. And so if I could have figured that out, I probably could have kept going with the gym. But I, I walked away from the gym. I had kind of ran my course. But for this lady or man, I'm not sure it was a lady or man, mm-hmm. um, I would identify that. What are your sticking points? Where do you feel stressed? We tend to see the thing, the world as black and white. And so if someone's in the corporate space, oftentimes they're like, I hate where I am and everything's bad and everything's wrong. And so I want to jump ship. And then we jump ship. And then again, we see everything as being you know, bad. And There's good and there's bad. Can I identify what's not working for me, where I feel stuck, where I feel stressed? Can I get support in those areas? Um, also, there's no failure in, in taking on a, a side project, you know, if it's going to add more passion and energy to your current practice. Mm. Um, yeah. You know... Uh, this is a tricky one. I mean, there's so many different angles. Because she has framed it hmm. to say uh, like she's giving up if she does the parts on job. Probably the absolute but, opposite. I mean, that's you putting your effort, put more effort in than, than hmm. you've ever put into anything because, you know, you, you didn't. That would show passion, I would imagine, as well. Because if I'm willing to take on another job so I can keep teaching yoga, it's not like I was willing to take on another job so I could stay in my corporate job. Hmm. So you've probably done the scary bit. Um Anything to do with work, the way I tend to work is I work backward. So I'll say, where do I want to be in a year in terms of lifestyle and income? That's the most important. The lifestyle is the most important thing to me. So how many hours do I want to work a week? How much money do I want to make a week? 
what do I want my life to look like? That's my starting point. And everything comes from that. Everything stems from that. Mm. So I would, I think that's a good place to start, regardless of what your issues will work or regardless of how you feel about your current position. Where do I want to be in 12 months? What does the lifestyle look like? How many hours do I work? How much money do I make? How many holidays do I take? How do I spend my time? Mm. When I um, was working in the pizza shop and completely lost, I did an exercise called the perfect day. And the perfect day is just that. You write from the first thing you get up in the morning, the last thing last time when you go to bed at night what does that day look like and it's not about sitting on a beach sipping cocktails because you get bored of that pretty quick it's what would a typical day look like and i wrote 12 fool's cap pages and tiny little things that starts to show you your values because you're not going to write oh i get my lamborghini and i drive around dublin you're probably going to write after class i get a chance to go for what i wrote at least after my class at the beach I bring my clients for coffee. It's cool to have clients that I actually like spending time with. Mm. After that, I go and do a bit of study. Then I have my lunch. Then I train myself. And I just put lots of detail in there. And it starts to give you a map, something to work toward. Generally, when we feel disillusioned or we feel stuck or we feel lost or we feel like we're giving up, I think there's a lack of clarity because people are not sure what does success look like. The perfect day is one way of finding what success looks like. Mm. I don't know if that's useful, but... That, yeah. Mate, that's brilliant. Um, yeah, that, that's, that's great. I can't, I, I can't add to that. I'm sorry what, to the lady that not be more. No, man, it's because it, well, firstly, it's the perspective. You know, th this person said they feel like they're giving up. But as you said, maybe it's that they might be comparing themselves to the people who are doing full time. By the way, um, if you're teaching yoga full time, it doesn't necessarily mean it's the right thing to do because mm -hmm. it be maybe it might become like a job. And if you do that part time job, you might go do your still your part-time yoga and realize how much you like yoga even more yeah. so it's it's just the 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 the, term, uh, the uh, wording there of saying am i giving up i think that's uh, that's the wrong mindset maybe but uh, the perfect day thing is a uh, is a good practical exercise thank you possibly two other quick ones to consider because yeah. i'm sure there's a bunch of work questions or but you know workers mm -hmm. i think work is one of the areas where people feel the most stuck because when it comes to health you can make changes pretty quickly when it comes to i don't know taking up a hobby you can do that in a day but sometimes with work you're like i've invested time in college and i've been here for a couple of years and i've got a mortgage or i've got commitments so you can feel like it's, again, black and white. I have to stay here or I have to jump ship and risk everything. The reality is you can take on a night course or you can take one little step, and that's important to know. Mm -hmm. But two little things for, for any yoga teachers listening that might be beneficial. There's an amazing book called The E-Myth, which is the entrepreneurial myth. Um, it's by Michael. I can't remember the guy's surname. Really simple idea. Um, it was a lady, uh, a parable. So this lady has a, she grows up baking cakes. Her grandmother teaches her how to bake cakes. She has a passion for baking. Mm -hmm. So of course she decides she's going to be a baker, open a bakery. Um, when she opens the bakery, she's suddenly inundated with bills and stresses and staffing and all this kind of stuff. And she's like, I don't want to do this anymore. And so he identifies in the book that a business has three main parts. There's the entrepreneur, who's the ideas person. Um, that's the high level person who's looking in and thinking we could do this. And that's the Elon Musk of the world or the Richard Branson. Then there's the manager who can take these ideas and make them a bit more practical. And then there's the technician who might be the person that teaches the class. And I don't think you can expect yourself to be all of those things. We'll have strengths and we'll have weaknesses. So it's worth considering getting some help. You know, if you're a freelance yoga instructor, maybe you want to collaborate more with other people. That takes pressure off. That adds your scope of who you can reach. So I think that's important. The other thing I think people should consider what work is, I think sometimes because we're looking on social media and other people seem to have the perfect job, people think their job is supposed to tick every box going. Um, every job has stresses and there's no perfect job like every job has ups and downs and stresses and everything else the important thing with work is that you recognize what you're working for okay so I earn a paycheck every week what does that allow me to do in my life you got to have meaning and purpose so there's a story years ago of a friend of mine his he used to work in a factory and everybody hated working in the factory they were on the line and this is a true story they all hated it and they throw up, turn up and they'd just be waiting for the weekend go for pints and there was one guy that would turn up every day with a big smile on his face and he hated it as well but he knew why he was there and the reason he was there was his dream was to work in a safari over in Africa mm. but he knew to get to the safari he had to save a certain amount of money and so the difference between showing up to work just to show up to work and get to the weekend versus showing up to work with a mission in mind that I'm working towards something was two very different things. Yeah. So I'll say to people, if you're in the corporate world and your dream is to be become a yoga instructor, some people think the dream happens when I open my first yoga studio. In reality, the dream happens the day that you turn up to your corporate job and you know why you're there. I'm here to put the money aside for yoga. I think mm. that's an important yes. uh, distinction. Yeah, brilliant, Pat.
Thank you. <laughs> You're not going to get a word in. <laughs> um, I'm halfway through. Adjust. I'm halfway through my 200 hour yoga teacher training. And we've been told by our trainer that next month we, <laughs> we have to teach a class to our peers. Sounds familiar. <laughs> I'm, an in, I'm an introvert by nature and therefore quite shy. How can I develop my confidence? The reality of confidence is confidence only comes through action. Um, it doesn't appear out of the sky. Um, I've had to learn this in so many different areas. So the lie that we tell ourselves is when I'm confident, I'll ask the person out or when I'm confident and I'll join the gym, when I'm motivated, I'll go and do the thing. The action comes first and then comes the feeling and people forget that sometimes. So example I'll give is if you've gotten into the sea, you probably didn't want to get in the sea before you got in the sea, but you feel so alive when you come out of the sea. And it's kind of the same thing. That person is going to feel so alive after they teach their class, if they've got the right mentality and they don't beat themselves up about it. A mm -hmm. um, couple of things to consider. I would say when I taught my class, again, I was aware that I can barely touch my toes. I can barely downward dog. I'm not a yogi. I'm not a traditional yogi. So there's no point me trying to be that guy. Um, so I asked myself, what are my strengths? And I said, well, I'm a presenter. I can tell stories. I understand breath work to a certain degree. And I used to teach fitness classes. So I took those elements and I put them into my class to make my class unique. So for this person, recognize that no one is you and that is your power. So what is her unique or his unique um, background that they can add to the class? Mm. Maybe it is that they're introvert. I mean, I introduced my class when I was out there and I said, I want to acknowledge everyone for being here. And I want everyone to recognize that we've all had our individual challenges. For some of us, we're introvert. And we're having to speak up in class. That's the challenge. For some of us, English is our second language. That's the challenge. For some of us, we love to move, but we can't sit in silence. That's a challenge. And so this lady could do the same. It kind of disarms the people in front of you by identifying that everyone's got their strengths and weaknesses. Yeah. Um, but I would say for that person, you know, from a very practical standpoint, preparation obviously makes you feel more confident in general. The more prepared you are, the more you kind of understand what you're trying to do. But also try to have that mentality I talked about earlier where I said that you doing it for the first time is a massive win before you even step on the mat and um, because you're showing up and you're leaning into fear. I'm a public speaker. I was the most scared guy in the world of public speaking, um, but I did 77 in a year just to get comfortable. And after each one, I do a little audit. What worked well? What didn't work? How can I improve? So this mm -hmm. person could do the same. What worked well? I did a nice intro. We did uh, you know, a nice grounding exercise at the start. What didn't work well, tried to squeeze in too many poses. How do I improve upon that? Take two of the poses out for the next class. Mm. Rinse and repeat. Just keep coming back and getting a little bit better each time. Yeah. Brilliant, Pat. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Not at the end. <laughs> next. <laughs> <laughs> not like I'm solving people's problems. I should say, anytime I talk with this stuff, I'm only talking to myself because oh, I'm such a flawed individual. I need to remind myself of this stuff all the time. <laughs> um, okay, this is a very honest one. Well, I mean, they're all honest, but this in particular is, um, I'm a yoga teacher, but I'm not in very good shape, and I'm self-conscious that people are judging me. To be honest, I don't practice much, about twice a week, and don't do any other form of exercise. I also, I also have a sweet tooth, exclamation mark. It's the start of a new year and I'd like to get into shape, but I don't know where to begin. Any advice? This could have been me that sent in the question <laughs> at Christmas I had. Um, yeah, so a couple of things again. There's an idea that everybody in the world is a piece of a jigsaw puzzle. And if we're in alignment and we're doing what we're supposed to do, the jigsaw puzzle works. But we can both be yoga teachers on the jigsaw puzzle. But there's certain people that will hear the, hear the message through your voice and others that will hear it through mine. And so if I'm going to stop myself from teaching yoga because I'm not in as good a shape as the next person, I'm doing a lot of people a disservice. The same way we talked about people are going to resonate with the guys that can't cross their legs. That's going to get people on the mat. If everybody was able to do the splits and, and whatever else, um, that would intimidate people. And so everyone's got their place. So in terms of this person teaching their own practice, I would not be intimidated by that. The judgment thing, this is probably not what people want to hear, but the reality is everybody's judging everyone all the time. It can either be judgment in terms of looking up to someone or looking down on someone. Both those things are judgment. But really it's just a reflection of where that person is at themselves. If someone is aware and conscious of where they are themselves, there's not as much of a judgment. They're just, they're just taking it all in and everything's neutral. Um, in terms of... Um, 
in terms of getting in shape, I think a couple of things, I think two things I always harp on about is one, I think a social element to getting in shape is really important. I think that helps a lot. We've, we've both seen that with jujitsu. I think there's kind of camaraderie there. There's a, you know, accountability. I think the second thing is you have to enjoy what you're doing and reflection is important because a lot of us are quick to read books and listen to podcasts and watch videos and all this kind of stuff to learn more, which is great. Um, we look to mentors, we look to coaches to learn more, but we can never learn more than we can learn from our own personal experience. So I would prompt people, if you've struggled with any goal in the past, the most important thing you can do is take out pen and paper and ask, why did I struggle last year? So I'd always have fitness clients come in in January and say, I want to join the gym and get in shape. And I'd ask, what did you do last year? Oh, I joined in January and I wanted to get in shape, but I struggled. But they'd never consider why did they struggle? Because mm -hmm. the mentality was, well, this year I'm going to have willpower and motivation. It's like willpower and motivation disappear pretty quickly when you're stressed. And so rather than that, you need a strategy. So if I was to look at last year, what didn't work for me? Um, I didn't create enough space for me to meditate and chill. Okay, that's going to happen again this year unless I come up with a strategy. So this person might consider those few things. Can it be a social activity where you've got other people involved that we keep you accountable and you've got the social interaction, which we all need? Mm. Uh, can it be something you enjoy so it doesn't feel like you're forcing yourself into a gym? We all have enough stress in our life without forcing yourself to do something you don't want to do. It says me after doing 200 hours of yoga and I hated yoga, but I, I learned to love it. Um, and then thirdly, can you reflect upon where you've struggled in the past? Again, problems and prescriptions. So I would ask, if I want to get in shape, what are the 10 potential problems that I've either come up against in the past or I'm going to come up against? And that person might say, lack of motivation, uh, don't have time to cook healthy meals, I'm on the road a lot, I sit down a lot. They'll make a list of all the things that have gone wrong in the past or could go wrong. And then on the flip side, they'll put prescription. Okay, so um, if I struggle with motivation, what am I going to do? I'm going to have a trainer once a week and then I'm going to do two sessions myself to keep my accountable. If I struggle with time to cook my meals, what am I going to do? Meal prep company. And I would go through it like that, a little mm. bit strategic. Because again, confidence comes from knowing that you're ready for, you know, it's from prepare for your, what, what do they say? Failure to prepare, prepare to fail. Yeah, a little bit of that and right? a little bit of hope for the, what is it? Hope for the best, but prepare for the worst. Or oh, you know, nice. be ready for the worst. Yeah. The analogy I use is if, if you go up Everest and the weather's nice on Everest and you're going to summit and you say, oh, I'm grand, I don't need to bring any jacket with me, I'll be fine. And then the weather turns, suddenly you got to turn around. But if you just say, well, potentially the, the weather could turn, I need this. And Oops, potentially... <laughs> Rachel's downstairs saying, why are you talking pony? <laughs> um, yeah, the more you can be prepared for any of those blips, I think the, the better. Mm. And also recognize it's a journey, you know, any any goal you've got, you're at A, you want to get to Z, stop focusing on Z, you know where that is, but just worry about how you get to B. So if you're getting a GPS from, I'm full of analogies today. I like it, man. <laughs> if you're getting a GPS from Dublin to Galway, you don't get in the car, put Galway into the GPS, it doesn't spit a million directions at you, it just says, drive 100 meters, and then you drive 100, and then it says, okay, turn left. And you to get one step at a time. So for this person, the first step might be go and do a PT induction. Do like do a introductory session with a personal trainer. Mm. And that's all you gotta worry about for now. Don't be overthinking it. Nice part. Analogies off the hook. <laughs> <laughs> right. I'm gonna screenshot that instead. And then I'm gonna open it. So yes. Right. Anyway, that's my <laughs> <laughs> now sorry, Pat, one second. This is unedited as always. Uh, now, here we go. What books would you recommend for self-development? Uh, the Naked Paleo. And <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, it's a broad question. Um, my favorite book ever is a book called The Strangest Secret by Earl Nightingale. The Strangest Secret by Earl Nightingale. There is a 25-minute audio of this book on YouTube. So people can listen to that. It came out in the 1950s. It was kind of the first book that birthed the first uh, the personal development industry. Um, it's really simple. Two real principles. One is you reap the seeds that you sow or something to that effect. So mm -hmm. try to put in positive thoughts and positive affirmations in your mind. And the second secret was something to the effect of you get paid for the value you add to the world. 
So mm, in the past, when I was a fitness trainer, I was adding a certain amount of value. And then when I did a master's in nutrition, it's like, okay, I'm a little bit more valuable now. So I'm going to make a little bit more money. And then I did group classes and then I added an online component. And the more tools you can add to your arsenal um, from a professional standpoint, the more value you add to your workplace or to your industry, the more money you'll make um, and the more of an impact you can make. So if you're a yoga teacher, that's one thing. If you're a handstand expert, that's another thing. The more tools you can add, the better. So you need to be constantly upskilling. So Stranger Secrets, a good book. Mm. Um Seven Habits of Highly Effective People is a kind of classic. Mm. Um, all the classics are good. My book is called Upgrade Your Life. It's <laughs> decent. It's uh, it's very introductory. But well, um, where we get that from, there, Pat? Where all good it? bookstores. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> There's one for everyone in the audience. Um, on the books front, what I would recommend is um, a balance of um, reading other people's books and also journaling and getting your own stuff out on paper. Because, again, you can read 100 business books but none of those business books are going to specifically tell you what the crack is with your own business. Um, so I, I have this idea of um, insight and integration. And insight and integration is just a different way of reading. Rather than trying to get through as many books as possible, mm -hmm. which some of us do, yeah. uh, I'm going to read until I get an insight. So I'm reading a book about, I don't know, how to grow an online business. And it says, you need to add more value for your customer. There's no point me saying, oh, that's a good idea, and they're just reading on. I could close the book at that point. I've had the insight, and now how do I integrate that? Pen and paper, okay, how could I add more value to my customers? And that's how to read a book, read, how to read a personal mm -hmm. development book. When I was in school, I was reading all the success books, and my best friend said to me, Pat, it's great you're reading all these books, but if the books were any good, would you not be successful after you re you'd read one? And I was like, uh. <laughs> <laughs> I had to lose it all before I, I started integrating. You know? Yeah, it's it, it, as you said, like you re can read so much, but the, the writing process, writing stuff down, and um, being practical about it is, uh, yeah, that that makes complete sense. But uh, actually, this links into the next question, potentially. What's the best way to approach goal setting? Mm, goal setting dot ie. I've got genuinely. <laughs> I've, yeah. I've got a free three hour masterclass. <laughs> oh, you swine! I didn't mean to you do that it. to you, Kevin. <laughs> <laughs> Turn off your podcast now. And go to my website. <laughs> um, no, I do a goal setting dot ie. There's actually a three hour free video series that takes people through how I do it. But effectively, um, it's a case of outlining where you are in the different areas that matter to you. So. For me, my business matters, my speaking matters, my family matters, my friends matter, my jiu-jitsu matters, and my mental health matters. Those are a couple of things that matter to me. Mm. So I would start by recognizing where I am and being very honest about that. I think it's important that you're honest about your starting point because a lot of people tend to skip over that bit. Um, they skip over where they are because it's sexier to think about where they want to go. But if you can't be honest about where you're starting from, you can't be honest about where you're going to go. Mm. Um, the other thing to recognize is that oftentimes we're trying to plant seeds for new goals before we've weeded the grass. Um, so in the same way, it's kind of like I did a three hour um, exercise last week where I looked at 2019 and I started with what, where did I win? What were my biggest wins in 2019? Developed as a speaker, did my yoga teacher training, did lots of jujitsu. Why did I win in these areas? I had a system, I had accountability, and I kind of just get clear on why it worked. And then on the flip side, where was I disappointed in myself in 2019? Well, there was times in personal relationships where rather than deal with emotions that I was feeling, I suppressed or I sedated or I went on nights out or I distracted myself on social media. Uh, where else did I, I, I struggle or was I disappointed? I wasn't consistent with my podcast. And I'll look at all my disappointments and then in the same way, why did I struggle in those areas? Didn't have a system, didn't have accountability, took on too much. Uh, ran away from my emotions rather than feel my emotions, uh, believed my negative stories rather than challenging them. And so I'm weeding the grass. Uh, and before I plant any new seeds and think about the goals that I want, I'm very honest. This is where I am. And sometimes that's painful. There was a guy at a seminar years ago and he came in and he said, I want to buy a BMW. That's why I'm here. And I'm looking at this guy. I'm like, what made you think I'm going to teach you how to buy a BMW? <laughs> He's like, you're an online business guy. I was like, okay. And we went through a few exercises and he came up three hours later. He goes, I recognize the need to have a better relationship with my son. That's Whoa. what I've taken from the seminar. And I was like, oh, cool. But that came from reflection of where he currently yeah. was because I had him write out, how do you feel about your family situation right now? And it's like, okay, that's not nice to look at. It's not, not comfortable. In the same way, it's not comfortable for me to say in 2019, there was times where I felt lonely or I felt um, self-doubt or I felt overwhelmed or I felt anxiety. And rather than working on conscious tools that support me, 
I went for a f- mad night out and felt twice as bad than it because I did that mm-hmm. loads in 2019. <laughs> you know, go through breakups or go through like taking on too much workload or just not allowing myself to slow down, which is a recurring theme. It's definitely one of my weaknesses. Um, you know, it's not comfortable to say that or, or to admit that, but by admitting that with myself and being honest with myself, it's like, okay, how do I set goals going forward? Mm. There's no point setting a goal of making twice as much money this year when the real work that needs to be done is consistent meditation practice and slowing down and having balance and all these kind of things. So how does this person set goals? Identify the areas that are important to you. Recognize where you are, what's working, what's not working, and why those things are working or not working. And then from that place, think about what would success look like? I love the question, mm. if, I, if you were to meet me for coffee 12 months from now, what would have had to happen in the last year for you to feel like you had a great year? And it really gets you thinking. So if we're to meet on this day, 12 months from now, you might say, well, you know, I've I've doubled the number of clients coming to my yoga class and I have half the hours that I'm doing. I take two holidays over the course of the year. I did two two courses which helped me upskill. I've deepened the relationship with my friends and I've met some great new people and I've saved 2,000 euro. Brilliant. Like, okay, roadmap, let's go. Mm. Goal settings that I (laughs) 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 Oh. Okay, two more questions. This is, no, I'm gonna, I actually did them in reverse order. So I like, oh no, sorry, I work a lot from home and find it hard to be productive. Mm. Advice, question mark. <laughs> I, work, I work from home as well and I'm not very productive. Um, again, a question that's very powerful on a Sunday. What needs to have happened by 5 p.m. Friday for me to feel like it was a productive and proactive week? So on a Sunday, I sit down, what needs to have happened by 5 p.m. Friday for me to feel like it was a productive week? That's you giving yourself parameters because people talk about productivity, but they've no idea. It's kind of like happiness. I want to be happy. What does happiness look like? I don't know. I want to be successful. What does success look like? Um, You know, so it's it's just not fair to yourself to be giving yourself um, goals that you don't know what they are. And so I love that question. You know, I sit down on a Sunday, what needs to have happened by 5 p.m. Friday for me to feel like it was a good week? This week for me, okay, record four podcasts, get on top of my emails, sort my invoices, and do five talks. That's my week. So that's how I know I had a productive week. Yeah. So that would be one thing for the person. Um, second thing is probably from an environmental standpoint, your environment is really important. I mean, you have a lovely space here to do your podcast. And it's one of those where you step into this space, you know, right, it's time to do a podcast. It's not like you're not doing it on your couch downstairs. When we work from home, sometimes it's easy to, you know, not have that space for ourselves. I think if you can carve out a space and set that environment up for success, whatever success means to you, that can be really beneficial. Um, environment in general is really important and people forget it. They kind of rely on willpower and, 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 you know, if you can set the environment up for success, you're, you're laughing. Um, Mm. I think that question is the main thing. Um, one other thing I do, I mean, it's super simple and super basic, but it works for me is every evening before I go to bed, I write down my top three priorities work-wise for the next day. And that's not sexy, but that's like, I'm all about the small wins over time. And the way I frame it to people is I started my fitness business on the beach with five clients. And in five years, we went to 25,000 clients. And the only business plan we ever had, I say we, the only business plan I ever had was every day I do three things to move my business forward. And that was seven days a week. And that was for five years. And so over a year, if you do three things for your business every day or for yourself every day, that's a thousand things in a year. Mm. So over five years, I did 5,000 things to move me forward. And that didn't matter if I was tired or hungover or sick or anxious. Mm. It was always three things that happened. So from a productivity standpoint, if you do three things a day, five days a week, that's 15 steps forward. But you got to be honest with yourself about what maintenance is versus what growth is. And what I mean by that is there's a difference between a to-do list and a success list. To-do list is like go and do the shop and pick up the kids from school, all the stuff that you kind of have to do. Success list is like the stuff that stretches you a little bit, record a podcast, schedule some social media posts, have a sales call, whatever it is, Mm. I think that can be useful. I think the question is everything, what needs to happen by Friday at 5 p.m.? And then schedule those things. You know, if you show me two things, if you show me your your bank accounts, um, uh, your bank statements for the last six months, and you show me your calendar for the last six months, I'll have a really good idea as to how you live your life. It's what what you schedule is important. Yeah. If a yoga class is important to you, you treat it as an appointment. Kind of the same thing at work. Yes. You know, do you schedule stuff for yourself? When I'm productive, I'm super productive. When I'm not productive, I'm the opposite. But, uh, you know, if I'm on an airplane for 10 hours, I can get a month worth of work done because I don't can't, there's nothing really else for me to do. Um, but I think if you're productive, if you're self-employed particularly, it's probably different if you're 
employed you, you kind of have to be there for, for a certain period of time but I know when I'm switched on I can get a lot done in two hours and that's nearly me happy for the day you know if I record a couple of podcasts in two hours I'm not going to kill myself for another six um, I think people need to recognize that as well um, if you look at athletes the higher performing an athlete is the more they re- rely on recovery mm-hmm. so if the Irish rugby player have a great uh, Irish rugby team have a great game on Sunday there's no point them saying oh we're, we're doing really good let's go into the gym on Monday morning and hit some PRs that would be craziness same thing from a me- mental standpoint just because you have a good day in the office on Monday and you like have productivity overload if your expectation now is that every day has got to be as good as your best day you can burn out pretty quick so it's important to kind of have a couple of tasks every day you want to get done and enough is enough sometimes I think mm. great Pat last question last question and that is if you could if you could give your younger self one piece of advice what would it be um get some fashion advice <laughs> <laughs> that's the same advice now um if i could give my younger self um don't believe all your stories um all suffering in life i think comes down to a story that we believe uh, about ourselves or about the world so when i was 24 i was close to suicidal at points you know to be blunt um because in my head when you're 24 and you're ambitious, and you're all these things, you're supposed to be successful. And I had a story about what success was. Success was everybody knows who I am. Because my my, my backstory was lacking confidence all my life, and never having self-esteem, and deciding that if other people believe in me, eventually I'll believe in myself. And so I was always chasing external validation, approval, acceptance, all these different things, rather than accepting myself. So at 24, when I had failed, quote-unquote failed, um, and didn't see the hidden wins that were probably there. Um, I decided that to be successful, you got to have this and this and this and this. So my story was that. And the only thing that caused me stress and suffering was believing that story. And um, there's a story about a guy called Sidney Banks. I don't know if I was telling you about this guy. He was a Scottish welder, never had done any spiritual work or anything else. And years ago, he was out walking with his friend and he turned to his friend and he said, hey, I'm depressed. And his friend said to him, you're not depressed. You just think you're depressed. And it hit him on such a deep level that he's like, wow, it's just my thoughts that cause me all my pain. He became enlightened seemingly in this moment. So he came up with a thing called the three principles, which is worth people checking out. Um, it's a philosophy for living, but kind of the same thing. I love Byron Katie's work. She looks at challenging and questioning your stories. Thework.com is her website, and that's all free resources. And Byron Katie will say, all stress in life is an expectation about how things should be. So if I'm stressed about my body, it's because I think it should look a certain way. And probably the should comes from Instagram. I'm looking at, I jokingly say, I'm a pasty Irish man and I always will be a pasty Irish man. If I look in Instagram and I see all the yogis with tans and six packs and I get stressed over that, I'm going to suffer if I believe that thought I should look like them. Rather than being like, I look the way I look and be grateful for the fact that I can walk and I can move and I can do jujitsu and all these different things. If I'm stressed about how my partner shows up, it's because I've decided they should show up in a different way. For years, I was stressed with my dad because I thought my dad's supposed to give me a hug. He's a dad. He's supposed to give me a hug. And I could never see all the ways he would show me love because I had decided he should give me a hug. So I had the blinkers on. Does that make sense? Mm. Uh, the, the, the person who decides that their yoga class should be perfect the first time they do it is going to suffer and have stress over the fact that they've set this expectation so high. So going back to your question, if I was to give my younger self um, some advice... It would be try to let go of the shoulds and don't believe all your thoughts. (laughs) I jokingly say in the seminars that if your kid comes home from school and says to you, um, Kevin called me fat in school today, you would never dream of looking at your kid and saying, that's because you are fat or you'd be a horrible parent. What do you do? You go to your kid and you say, that's not true. How could that possibly be true? And you start getting them to challenge it. You look for evidence that it's not true. You find all this evidence of where they're fit and they're healthy and they're great and everything else. You build up their self-esteem and their confidence. As we get older, as soon as a negative thought comes in, most of the time we believe it and then we look for evidence that it's true. Um, You know, I I see myself and I I think I'm a little bit heavier than I should be. Mm. And suddenly that's all I can think about. 
Mm. I say to people, it's like when you get a spot on your face and you can no longer see your face, you can only see the spot. Yeah, so, um, true. so being able to challenge and question your thoughts is, is, is powerful. Meditation allows you to create a bit of space from that. Journaling allows you to get the mental madness that goes on in our mind on the paper. Mm. So I wish I'd had these tools when I was younger. But I'd be telling my younger self, go gentle with yourself. You're doing okay. You don't have to figure it out straight away. Yeah, you, you mentioned, Pat, um, when we were downstairs before we started recording, that you, do you ex- did this exercise where it was a letter to your 10-year-old self. Would you mind explaining what that was? It sounds fascinating. Yeah, I think it's a psychotherapy exercise. Um, I did it at a retreat a couple of years ago. I was telling you I'm at this nine-day retreat. There's a couple of lessons in this retreat. This was a time where I was seeking so much um, external noise. I was reading as many books as I could. I was trying to read a book a week or two books a week, like trying to get through as many courses as I could, get all the certifications, become a life coach, do NLP, do this, do that, do the other FMS, do kettlebells. <laughs> uh, certifications coming out of my eyeballs because, again, it was, it was to some degree, it was a, uh, what's the word? Uh, telling myself, you know, it's great to do certifications, great to upskill, but sometimes it gets to the point where you're looking so far outside of yourself that you just have no trust in yourself telling yourself if, like I had a client a couple of months ago and she I was like what are you going to work on today she's like um you know I have so many books on the bookshelf that I haven't opened and you know I feel really bad about that I said this is not about the bookshelf this is about you don't think you're good enough as you are to be a coach because she was a coach as well so you I said what's going to happen if you read every book on the bookshelf how are you going to be different as a person she said, probably not really I'm going to find more books to read Mm. Yeah, you just got to act upon what you already know. Um, mm. So I go to this retreat and I was at the zone where I was I going to Tony Robbins for four days and Tony gives me some strategies. And then I go meet Jack Canfield and Jack Canfield. And, and I go to this retreat and it's really expensive. And it was funny because I met the guy that was running it in America. And he said, I'm doing a retreat. You should come to it. I said, okay, I'll come. I said, where's the retreat? He goes, Bally Vaughan, which is like 45 minutes from my house in Galway. <laughs> I'm like, geez, I'm running all over the world trying to find these courses. And this is 45 minutes from my house. So I go to the retreat. I'm the only Irish guy there. The rest of them had flown in from America. And the first day, the guy gives us a journal and he says, okay, I want you to go down to the cafe or find some space for yourself and write about your fears or write about your youth. I can't remember what it was. So start writing. And I'm calculating in my mind, I'm like, I've paid a couple of hundred dollars a day to go and write in a cafe. I'm like, hmm, I'll wait till tomorrow and see what happens. Come back the next day, same thing. Go and write about your dreams. I'm like, okay, day three. And as the thing goes on, I'm like, geez, I'm spending a lot of money to write in a journal. When's he going to give us the magic? And what I came to realize by the end of the nine days was, geez, I've learned more about myself in nine days than I could have ever learned from all the books in the world. Mm. And that kind of flipped my perspective a little bit from always seeking external noise to allowing what was inside of me to come out. But halfway through the retreat, I pulled him aside and I said, look, I'm really trying to be invested in this program. I'm really trying to, I'm not holding anything back, but I feel like everyone else is having breakthroughs and I'm not. I just want you to know that I'm not holding back. And he said, I know you're not. He said, don't worry, it'll, it'll, whatever's supposed to happen will happen. And he did this exercise, the letter to your 10-year-old self, where we had brought a picture of ourselves in or around that age where you're 10. And he said, I want you to take out the picture. I can't remember if we did a meditation or a visualization of some kind. And he basically had us connect with the person in that picture and go back in time, knowing everything we know now, write a letter to that person with what they needed to hear. So I remember being bullied when I was a kid at that age. And and as I, I went back in time, the letter that I wrote, and I think it's the same for most people, the letter I wrote, I broke down. I was crying all over the journal writing this letter and it was kind of the breakthrough I needed. And really what it showed me was like the need for self-compassion and forgiveness and not to be so hard on myself and, you know, to, to yeah, just not just not to be so hard on myself. We're, we talk about self-development all the time, but self-acceptance is, is oh, a, yeah. a huge. Mm. And the letter that I wrote was exactly what I needed at that time. I'd started public speaking. Of course, when you're doing public speaking or social media, you get some kickback, of, t- of course, that's normal. Some people are not going to resonate. And the letter I wrote to this kid was, you know, keep being yourself. Mm-hmm. Um, don't feel the need to dress in a certain way just to impress other people. Uh, you know, being cool, as, as cheesy as this all might sound, I said being cool is showing up as yourself and being yourself and not feeling the need to change for anyone. Um, being cool is being a leader, not to the cool kids, but just doing what you feel is right. And I signed it off and I was crying into the, the journal as I signed it off, but I wrote your biggest fan, Pat. And I was like, <laughs> you know, I was like, what would be possible for me if I could embody that every day and be my biggest fan rather than 
because look we're all the same like it's, you can have moments where you feel great and you're alive and you're, you're on top of the world and you, you are your biggest fan and you think you're magic and everything else but then equally we have the moments where we're sh- huge critics of ourselves, and um, just trying to spend more time in that biggest fan mode is important so that exercise can be really powerful for people mm. um, do it in the comfort of your own home as I told you I used to do that in seminars but it wasn't the right container for it it was too many people in the room it was yeah. I think people need a bit of space and a bit of time for that one and um, to feel safe and like it's like yeah it's a vulnerable it's a vulnerable thing I suppose to you know look at everything you've been through whatever you've been through everyone's been through stuff and to connect with that kid and look the theory is we've all got that inner kid inside of us I mean you you talk about inner child work um I don't know if you're familiar with that idea of inner child mm-hmm. work that I guess there's the highest self and there's the wounded self. So the highest self is the me that's brilliant and the me that's inspiring and energetic and enthusiastic. And I could present today to a thousand people in Dublin and people say, wow, he's so great. The same guy, I could be in my local post office tomorrow and bump into someone I've known all my life and feel really socially anxious. Like that's that's my life. That's how I am. And I think we all are to some degree, you know, you're, you're on a high and you're low. So the highest self is like when you're connected and you're in flow and all these things. The wounded self is like the inner child. So it's like that insecure child that wants to be loved and wants to be good enough. That's always there. Um, you see these bodybuilders and I think a lot of the bodybuilders are guys that when they were teenagers didn't feel good enough or they had some trauma of some kind and they decided, I'm going to lift weights, I'm going to be big and strong and tough, I'm going to put on a suit of armour and no one's ever going to get to me. And of course, now they're 30, 40, 50, whatever age they are, the inner child is still in there. The vulnerable Mm -hmm. and how that inner child reacts is different for everyone, but that could be anger, that could be like, you know, and so I think it's important to just make peace with that and like the compassion for yourself. You're like, I'm all these things, I'm not, you know... I'm not supposed to have all the answers. I'm not supposed to get things perfect. I'm not supposed to, you know, whatever it is. Mm. Um, I think it's important work. The, the, these exercises are, to me, fascinating because I, I'm, I teach, uh, train teachers, um, t- train people to be yoga teachers. And I find that where you get real breakthroughs is through these type of activities where they're having to practice self-acceptance or just self just analyzing themselves their own thoughts and one one other thing you mentioned downstairs and if you if you can't talk about it and if it's confidential that's fair enough but is um the exercise where you people you were in a room with people and you come up behind them and you tell them something you needed to hear yeah what what was that again (laughs) this sounds fascinating well years ago um again in that time i oh i'm always I kind of jokingly say I'm a hippie with a buzz cut now. <laughs> like, <laughs> like, I look like a conventional dude, but I just, I'm fascinated by everything, whether it's just any form of meditation or breath work or plant medicine or music or art. Like, I'm interested in it all. I just think everything's super fascinating and I want to learn and I'm a seeker or whatever. And so years ago, I didn't go, I was going to these events. I didn't know what I was going to. So I went to this event in Costa Rica. I was probably 25 at the time. Had had a bit of success with mm-hmm. the business in Galway. And I go to this thing and it's all these conscious leaders. That was like kind of the what it was. And I, I don't know what conscious mean it meant at the time, you know. I just like a bunch of hippies. <laughs> <laughs> and um, I go to this event, it was it, it was it was cool. It was maybe a hundred people from all over the world. There's a bunch of lectures, famous speakers, there's breakaway workshops, there's fitness, there's yoga. I wasn't going near the yoga. Fuck that. <laughs> <laughs> I remember we were at dinner one night and I'd had a beer and uh, have my dinner and some guy in a fur coat just rocks up to the table. He's like, we're going to the beach. We're doing breath work. I'm like, what's breath work? But I just like follow him to the beach and I had my first breath work experience. And I was like, what just happened? Like tripping out completely. Mm. I didn't know what it was. And I like Wim Hof hadn't really appeared on the scene. I, I went and did a week with Wim since in Poland, but no one knew who Wim Hof was at that time. Or maybe I'm sure some people did. Um, anyway, at this course, they would always do a, a big closeout ceremony. So at one of the courses, one of the exercises we did was actually at that same course, I was just talking to someone about this last week, so I mentioned it. We did a cacao ceremony. Mm. I'm like, what are these hippies doing? Hot <laughs> <You know? laughs> chocolate. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so I'm out at the, like everyone's, there's all this chanting and everything else is going to, I'm just looking around me and I'm like, I wish my friends could see me. This is daft, you know? I'm like, give me a beer. <laughs> I drink my hot chocolate. I'm like, I don't know what the fuss was about, right? Let's go to the bar. And um, so there's all this stuff. It was funny how it comes to you. And then years later, you're like, oh. Mm. Um, so the closeout ceremony, they'd, they would always do something big. So again, there's 100 to 200 people in the room and you had to walk around the room. The first exercise was you would walk around the room and maybe for four minutes, 
I think it was Lisa Nichols that facilitated this. She's a lady in the film The Secret. Um, amazing turnaround story. She's the first African, Af- Afro-American woman to go from starting her own business to putting it on the stock exchange or whatever. So mm. she's like phenomenal. Is that a good film, The Secret? Is it based, is it from the book? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah. Right. It's worth a look. I mean, okay. look, the, the mistake people make with The Secret is thinking that you manifest these things just by thinking about them. So mm-hmm. um, I've worked with a bunch of those people like John D. Martini, who's in The Secret, Jack Canfield. Um, I've had a fascinating conversation with a bunch of those people. And, and they'll tell you that, I can't remember, is it 12 or 13 kind of universal principles that are there, that whether you believe them or not, they're in effect. So it's like gravity. Um, I can say there's no such thing as gravity, but gravity still works. And so the law of attraction is the, the secret is about the law of attraction. I will attract, I will manifest what I think about. But that's only in conduction or con- conjunction with the law of action, which mm. is when I take action on something, the law of reciprocity, when I, what I give out comes back, all these other laws. So the secret narrowed in on one of the 13 universal laws or universal principles. And because of that, there's a lot of critics that will say it's a lot of ho- airy fairy, but there's definitely something to it. So anyway, this lady from The Secret is facilitating the closeout exercise. There's a hundred of us in the room. And what we had to do was, I laugh because I look back at myself and I'm just like this like uh, insecure Irish guy in his mid-twenties, trying not to get sunburnt out in Costa Rica, doing breath work, surrounded by conscious leaders, just not, not knowing what's going on. And they told us, you got to walk around the room and you're going to connect and hold hands with stranger like whoever's in the room so you, mm. i'll walk around right i see kev hold hands with kev make eye contact and you would say the words i see you and they said i see you signifies that i see you in all your darkness and light and this made no sense to me at the time i see you for good and for bad i see you um i see you at your worst and at your best i see all of you i'm not concerned with you having to be perfect all the time i know that you're an imperfect being i'm an imperfect being as well but i see it all and i i, I respect you and, and i'm there for you and when someone said, I see you, you would pause and you would, you would acknowledge it and take it in. And you would say, I am here. And I am here meant I am all of these things. And thank you. <laughs> so I'm just run, running around the room trying to like not get caught with someone that hugs for too long. <laughs> <or> like, <laughs> as I was telling you, you'd say, I see you. And I would, I was, I'll be honest, I was just going through the motions. I felt super awkward. I see you. The real, the real out there people who are mm. Mm. really looking at you. Yeah. Mm. <laughs> they make those noises. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> They're not going to look away. I've got to keep looking. Yeah, I'm just like, oh, let this four minutes end. So anyway, one of the other exercises, which again was interesting, was we spread out throughout the room. Half the room would stand with their eyes closed and the other half would walk around for the given period of time and walk up behind you and whisper in your ear words that you needed to hear as a child. So I would whisper words that I needed to hear into other people's ear. Mm. And I think this broke people. Everyone was crying and, 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 and everything else because you're, there's something interesting in verbalizing something. And I often get people to talk at my seminars, not just write notes. They actually talk them because when you say something out loud, it becomes a lot more real. Mm. that can be jarring for people like it's like it could be as simple as someone says my dream is to leave my corporate space and become a yoga teacher and if someone says that out loud it's just a lot of people will get emotional just saying something. so anyway when i'm saying these words into your ear um like you're enough just as you are and you don't need to change if i whisper that in someone's ear it's emotional for me to say it it's also emotional for the other person to hear it and look everyone takes different meanings from these um exercises but for me the meaning was what's personal is universal meaning the things that i hold so close to me that i think make me um not love not lovable or whatever it might be are the things that we all experience and mm. you know talk about the late late show appearance years ago me being shy and feeling a bit timid and feeling vulnerable and all those things. A lot of people probably were endeared by that because they could see themselves in that. Mm. Um, and maybe when someone goes on and they're cocky and they're brash and they're all, they're all those things, maybe people don't see themselves in that. So what's personal is universal. The things that I hold close to myself that I'm afraid to say. We see this with men's mental health. Men think they can't talk and men think they can't share how they feel. And men can't share their insecurities about anything about sex or about life or about money or about whatever. And then when someone says something, it just opens up everything. Mm. <laughs> I was at a talk last week. Amazing. I was doing this talk at an event and the lady that was speaking before me, I think I told you this one, the lady that was speaking before me was a love and intimacy coach. So she's talking about love, intimacy and sex. And she's doing her talk and the room was kind of timid, 
Like she asked the question, she said, who in the room is comfortable talking to their partner about sex? And every room in the hand went up. And I was thinking, that's definitely not true, you know? She goes, who's not comfortable talking to their partner about sex? No hands went up. Mm. I was like, okay, yeah. It was like not a traditional Irish audience <laughs> or else you're full of it. And uh, she did a bit of Q and A and some guy put up his hand and he goes, I have a small penis. Can you give me advice on how to, um, how to please a lady? And there was silence in the room and someone just gave a massive round of applause. People <laughs> looked at each other and say, it's so inspiring to hear someone just own whatever. That's unbelievably honest. Yeah, and it, it opened up the room completely in the same way that when you share <sighs> a story of your greatest failure or you you share your greatest insecurity, you see it as a weakness. Fair play to him. Just, it was amazing. Yeah, it was amazing. And it completely changed the dynamic at what the top. What was the question? I got, I, I got, I kind of just thought <laughs> of the small penis bit. I, I got a small penis. What's it? How, how, can, how, I can, how can I please my lady or some, or okay. a lady or something like this? What, do you, just, what do you say? I'll take some notes. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. We were uh, saying, obviously the next person's going to, I have a massive penis. How am I going to, how can I deal with this situation? You know, but, um, wow, man, that's, but you know, Pat, I think that, and this may be a cliche thing to say, but, in yoga and yoga public yoga classes, you can do doing all the postures, and that's that is essential to do physical movement, open up, strengthen your body, be connected to your body. But what I realized is I am getting so much out of these more immersive experiences where I'm doing a six hour teacher training, so it's a whole day, six hours mm. with a half an hour break, and you're with the people for the whole weekend, or you're doing a workshop where it's two to three hours. And then, then you can start tapping into little exercises like this. When you do a public class, you got that hour. It's just an hour. Yeah. People have come after work. They don't know each other. They're with strangers, essentially, pretty much. And therefore, you, it, God, you've got to be so sensitive. Like yesterday, I did this thing called TRE, Trauma Releasing Exercises. Mm. And I learned this from Helena Walsh, who's a voice coach, because she did them with me like, as, a, as a private class. And when I started talking about why we were doing it, I realized I had to be quite um, considerate about not, I didn't even call it trauma. I said tension releasing exercises. Mm -hmm. I didn't want to use the word trauma because people might have a reaction like, I don't have trauma. Yeah. What is trauma anyway? And I, but what, what, I, what I found out is that what you're talking about there, the how to talk to your younger self, writing a letter to your younger self with a picture of yourself as a 10 year old, saying the advice that you needed, but to someone else, all of this stuff is yoga as well. It is a, that self inquiry, that self acceptance and coming back to our true nature. But it's, and I, and I, I really think if you're a yoga teacher, listen to this, I think this is a, a something that we as, as yoga teachers, neglect a little bit tradition because now yoga is almost kind of western gymnastics it's handstands and all that stuff sure. which is all great and yeah. really and maybe the equally as important as what we're talking about here but we really need to even if it makes you feel uncomfortable which yeah. it did, did for me because yeah. i'm a bit of a geezer you know like i mean like i kind of used to drink a lot and party and you know like watching sports and stuff but i'm, I'm changing and i'm starting to accept that as you said, the hippie with the buzz cut. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I'm starting to accept that side of myself. And I'm finding that it's really, oh, I was going to say nourishing. I was going to say nourishing, <laughs> but I'm not. It's so conscious, kid. <laughs> I know. But it's really good for me that I am, um, all of this stuff, basically, Pat, I love. Mm. I, I, and I love it. And I want to share it with other people. And um, and I think that we, we it's our almost responsibility as yoga teachers to show people and facilitate uh, um, environments where people can learn to self-accept as opposed to, right, if I can't do this bit so a handstand, I'm mm. not a yogi. Like you felt like I felt at the very start yeah. of our journey. <laughs> Br bringing a full circle, when we talk about when I started my fitness classes with five people on the beach, um, I transitioned from being a douchey personal trainer in Dublin who would stand beside you at the lap pull down machine and count reps. And that was all I would do five, six, seven. And then I'd send you a meal plan with chicken and broccoli on it. <laughs> and then I'd charge you 50 or 60 quid a session. 
and that business didn't work. And then I went back to Galway and I go through this mental health struggle for six months and I'm like very aware now that everybody's got stuff going on. Like e the people that hide it the most probably have the most going on. And so I start with five clients and the whole philosophy with five clients was be absolutely present with these people before I knew what presence was, but be there. Don't be thinking, don't be on your phone, don't be worrying about anything else. Just be there for 45 minutes, three times a week and this thing will grow. That was the business uh, standpoint. Um, but the mini acknowledgements to people I always say like I grew up wanting to do strength and conditioning classes for professional athletes and then when I started working with the general public it was like wow you tell you acknowledge someone for doing their first push-up and see them light up that's worth more than helping an, I don't know for me at least that's worth more than anything else mm. and when I I took on a couple of trainers when, when I had my gym I think I had four trainers at one point and we had little things, little systems in place to make sure everyone felt acknowledged. So you, you, you had to use each person in the class. You had to use their name at least twice in the class. You had to touch them without being awkward. So, you know, give them a tap on the shoulder to say, well done. You had to be acknowledging people. And, um, yeah, you feel silly sometimes doing this stuff, but it's also important. And like the human connection piece is so important. Anyone wondered about growing a business? I mean, look, if you're going to just teach a yoga class, there's enough people doing that already. But if you're making people feel something, that's how Starbucks became what Starbucks became. Starbucks sell coffee, but they sell it at three times the price of any other place. The way mm -hmm. they did that was they said, hey, what's your name? They wrote your name on a cup. Oh. And then they shout your name. It's called the Starbucks experience. Like, the, the, Kevin, you're like, wow. Might be the, you might, but that might be the only person in the day that calls you by name. Mm. I've seen this recently with people, you know, you end up sitting beside a guy on the bus the other day and he was telling me his wife had passed and he feels lonely and he'd gone to Dublin to meet someone for coffee and we never know what's going on in the people around us. Uh, mm. uh, and you got to assume that, you don't got to assume anything, you just got to show up and like make an effort. And again, yeah. like that, that, that's all your business plan needs to be as a starting point is can I be absolutely there for the person in front of me? Can I acknowledge any little wins that they have? Can I take an interest in them. Um, Pat, that's, uh, that, uh, what is it called, the Starbucks effect, did you say? I think the Starbucks experience, I think there's a book, something like the Even Starbucks if they spell experience. your name wrong on the cup. They still, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. They um, they're like, Keith, yeah, my name's Keith, that's fine. <laughs> that but the, but those little things, um, th that I think that was what changed that. And I say with my class, and I think this is useful for, for any fitness professional of any kind, probably for any job of any kind, who, it's important that all of us take pride in our work, even if it's not the job that we want to be doing at that time. So I don't know. I don't want to. I look back and I was I was working a pizza shop seven years ago and I I didn't want to be there. I had a master's in nutrition. I was a fitness guy and then I was selling pizza and I felt I just I didn't want to be there. And there's nothing wrong with working that work if you like that work. But mm -hmm. I didn't like that work. And there's something wrong with working a job you don't like. And if I look back, I saw myself as a guy that was dropping pizzas onto tables. But if you took me back to that now, I would see myself that was going to have a hundred amazing interactions every day and was going to make people smile and was going to acknowledge people and all that. Because you got to take pride in your work and you see people work every type of job. I've seen a great video the other day of a guy shining shoes on the streets in New York and his personality is just phenomenal. He's just having banter with thousands of people a day, making them smile. Mm -hmm. And that's the most you got to assume that whatever your job is, you got the most important job in the world. Even if it's not where you want to be right now, if you can make the most of where you are, you'll tend to find the next step. But for anyone in the fitness space, anyone, again, in any space, my philosophy of business was I want to bring belief and belonging to people. I want to give them a sense of belief they don't currently have, mm -hmm. even if it's just a temporary thing. And I want to make them feel a part of something more. Um, so part of a community. And I... Oh, sorry, sorry, I'm rambling probably a bit, but... Oh, good, let it go. It's the uh, coffee kicking in. <laughs> the turmeric. Turmeric, yeah. Such a hippie. If you're wondering why our lips are slightly <laughs> yellow, they're not, though. They're mine. But it's because we're drinking turmeric coffee. I have this... Next level. I have this philosophy of, like, just the waves of emotion. And I told you this morning, Dublin taxi drivers are my spirit animal. <laughs> I always have great interactions with them. They'll, I'll get in and for some reason they just give me like a motivational speech for 30 minutes and then at the end of the journey they'll be like what do you do and I'll be like oh, I do a bit of speaking and they'll be like sure why am I doing all the talking and I'm like <laughs> yeah no but I love listening to them but there was a taxi driver a couple of years ago and he said to me oh what are you doing I said I'm a speaker he goes I want to be a speaker as well and I said what's your philosophy what would you share with the world and he said most people think success is A to B in a straight line whether it's a relationship or it's a yoga business or it's health or whatever he says A to B is a straight line hmm. And he said, if you think about a heart rate monitor, the heart rate monitor is up and down and up and down and up and down. He goes, as soon as it flatlines, you're dead. 
And so what I took from that is we shouldn't be hoping for like a stress-free life. We shouldn't be relying on positive thinking that everything's going to be fine. We should expect that we're going to have struggles. We're going to have ups. We're going to have downs. We're going to learn more from the downs than we ever are the ups. But I think what's important with that is to recognize that it's like a wave of emotion. I think sometimes you just got to ride the wave and just be where you are. And for me, again, I could be on a high today doing a talk and talking to you. I might be feeling a bit low tomorrow, just mental health or just general stress. And there'll be someone at Jiu-Jitsu that will acknowledge me and say, good job, Pat. That's mm. all I need to make me be back up here again. And then I can pass that to someone and it's just this reciprocal thing. So it's a case of, I suppose, looking out for people when you're on a high mm. and being willing to kind of take an acknowledgement when you're, when you're not feeling the best. Mm. One more thing, unless you have more questions, but no, man. I took this from uh, uh, one of the girls I met at the yoga teacher training. She was kind of like me. She had very little experience, but I think women are just more flexible than men. So she was better at the poses. Mm. And she was super nervous coming up to the exams and I could see she was stressed and I just pulled her aside and I was like, is everything okay? And she said, please don't talk to me. I'm going to cry if, if, if you talk to me. I said, what's going on? And she said, please don't talk to me. Please don't talk to me. And I said, are you nervous? And she broke down. She said, I'm so nervous. And she was a ball of anxiety for the week. And I looked at her and I said, do you not think you're supposed to be nervous? And it kind of shook her. She's like, what do you mean? I was like, you've never taught a yoga class before. You're teaching a yoga class. Do you not think it's normal to be nervous? And she's like, what do you mean? And I was like, I said, I think your problem is your resistance to the feeling. You've got a feeling, which is nervousness. You're trying to resist it and push it back down and pretend it's not there. The resistance is what's causing the suffering. If you can just accept where you are, you'd typically be okay because, again, you just ride the wave. Mm -hmm. And again, when I look back to 24-year-old Pat that was depressed, I was resisting the fact that I shouldn't be here, I shouldn't be here, I shouldn't be here. It was the resistance that was causing the issue. Mm -hmm. If I was like, I'm depressed, why am I depressed? Okay, everything's going wrong okay, what can I do to move myself forward rather than we've all got a friend that is down on the dumps and, and is pissed off at their situation. Mm. So I shouldn't be here. I shouldn't be here. I shouldn't be here. You can't move out of shouldn't be here. You've got to say, I am where I am. How do I move forward? Mm. And so I said to her, stop trying to make your voice not shake. Stop trying mm. to make your palms not sweat. Let that stuff happen. Mm. And typically you'll be fine. Pat, it's so funny you say that because the TRE exercises, trauma or tension release exercises, the idea behind them is that it causes tremoring in your body. So you use tremor. Yes, in, let it at, out. Involuntary tremoring. And you let in, one, one, you're letting energy out. Because that energy, you have energy, it has to go somewhere. But two, you're getting used to your tremoring, like your hand will tremor or your jaw will tremor when you're talking. And you're letting yourself tremor hmm. and breathing through that. And that's why those exercises are so invaluable. Um I want to share one with you, actually. You, you gave me the Starbucks experience, mm. so I'll give this one to you. The IKEA effect. Okay. Everything in here is for IKEA. So it, the IKEA effect is if you give people a table, this table, let's say, they will, and you ask them to put a monetary value on it, they'll write it down. But if you give them the same table that's deconstructed and they have to construct it themselves, they then put a value on it and the value is higher. Now, this, I, think, I believe it's called the IKEA effect. And my, my point is, if you just try to give someone, I think this is my what I get from it. If you try to just give someone the solution, they're not going to value it as much as you're, you can't push someone into something, but instead you're, you're pulling them along, you're yeah. guiding them. And this is what I really love about these experiences where it's six hours of a day or three hours of a day. You're getting back and forth. You're figuring it out between you and you're acting as that guide or that facilitator as opposed to come to this class for an hour. And don't get me wrong, public classes are fantastic and I love teaching them yeah. and I'm going to continue to teach them for as long as I can. But a lot often it's one way. Mm. You're, you're speaking at people. And if people can give back to you, then I think they get more value out of it. Yeah, well, everyone wants to be heard, right? And everyone wants to feel like they're adding something to the conversation. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. That's the IKEA effect. <laughs> <laughs> I don't. I don't know what what this effect is sponsored this is. by Starbucks and IKEA. <laughs> <laughs> the hippies with buzz cuts are gone commercial. Um, <laughs> something just just sprung into mind. I ran a men's retreat a couple of months ago, which was massively fulfilling. I'm looking for. I'm going to do a lot of men's work this year, mm. and I know there's guys that do men's circles and stuff like that, and I kind of I think it's amazing. I always see my space as being. I've got a very mainstream audience and maybe I'm the foot in the door for people. That's my hope. You know, men, men will come to an event that I run and I'll teach them some personal development stuff. And then if they see the men's circles, which might not seem as accessible to them starting off, they might have the confidence then to go into that. When I have my gym, 
I would want people to come and train with me feel they could get off the couch and get started and then when they got to a certain level I'd say hey you should go to CrossFit now so I would always see myself as the bridge Um, but I ran a men's retreat a couple of months ago and I had a yoga friend of mine come in and facilitate and we were talking about um, you know uh, I think an issue for a lot of people in spiritual communities like how do I charge for my services and there's a kind of moral debate with that Mm. this is just my take people could take this or leave it as, as, as whatever way but I think he was charging five or ten euro pays you go for his classes and he wanted to have a big impact and he said you know i want to make it accessible so i can have that big impact and we're doing this retreat and i brought him out into the driveway and i showed him all the cars that were in the driveway and you're looking at like beautiful cars except for my one because i don't care about cars but all these lovely cars big money on cars i said a guy who spends eighty thousand euro on a car is not going to value a class that's five euro he's not going to turn up to a class that's five euro so you think you're doing him a favor but he's not going to turn up for that so you got to kind of be aware of that as well. Mm-hmm. It's not just about the value that you place on it. You know, it's, it's, it's more about, you know, if someone's got a lot of money or someone's, you know, in that position, obviously you got to have different pricing structures and you got to cater for everyone as much as you can. But I see that myself. You know, if someone wants to do a, a coaching call with me, I'll charge a lot of money and it's not because... I think I'm so great that I deserve a lot of money, but I know if someone pays a lot of money, they're really going to be present for that hour. They're really going to think about what they want to get from it. And they're invested. And that's the most important thing. Mm. If someone pays a bit more for a yoga class, they're invested. They get better results. So I think it might be. And that is huge for people teaching yoga book or anything in in this realm about the financial side yeah. of it. Ultimately, how much do you value yourself, your time and if you want to do this for a living you have to charge a certain amount so now for me i charge above average and if they don't want it want it it's fine i can take it or leave it because what i'm finding myself now is i work less hours and get paid more Mm. so i am happier now because i'm not uh i spend more time with you know rach and the dog and and whoever and i when i do work i i feel satisfied that i'm getting paid what i'm worth as opposed to I remember we did our 200 hour, one of the people in the course put their hand up and said, I've started teaching classes for five euro and I felt kind of good about it. Mm. And the trainer said, you're devaluing yoga. Mm. We're quite harsh. It was <laughs> like, you're undermining, you're basically bringing it, making it difficult for the rest of us. Mm. Now, whether that's the right thing to say or not, but in a way I can see some truth in that. It's like, okay, maybe do it for free if you want to, or do it for charity. But if you're looking to make a living from it, uh, going Going cheap or trying to compete by price is a race to the bottom. Yeah. And people will then value you to say, oh, yeah, I'm going to go and do, I do my yoga class with Mary because she's cheap. You don't want, that's, you don't want those people yeah. because they, they're, they're going to you because you're just the cheapest option as opposed to, look, Mary, she's a little bit above average, but she's worth it for X, Y, Z reasons. Mm. Uh, you know, I just went Pat Davili there. I went <laughs> just, <laughs> just sprout, sprouting uh, <laughs> so sorry, like that, you was, um, <laughs> that was something I learned, you know, relatively early with the fitness when I came back. Uh, people told me that, you know, don't sell a class, sell uh, a package. And the package is looking at what does that person need? So it could be an interesting one, you know, for people to kind of mull over what you talked about earlier that, right, you've got the public class. Maybe you're not going to be able to provide a chance for self-reflection and uh, journaling questions and all this stuff in the class. But what's to say you can't do 10 classes plus an online community plus a weekly email that has a journaling question and suddenly that's gone from a class that's an hour long to a package that is about self-reflection and self-discovery and you sell a bit more for the package and that's good for you because it obviously uh, leverages your time a little bit better but also for them because they're actually people like to get a result rather than just a session so Mm. the reason my fitness class grew back in the day was two things one was it was a you know obviously the the community aspect of it and the, the belief and belonging but I had a I had a money back guarantee and it was a double your money back guarantee. If you don't drop a dress size in your first 28 days or a clothes size in your first 28 days with me, I'll give you double your money back. And the thinking with that was it's very clear. You're going to come to my class for a month. You're going to drop at least a jean size. It's a definite offering uh, or you get double your money back. That's kind of mm. we call it the, the godfather offer. It's an offer you can't refuse. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so it might be worth considering for the, for the yogis or for anyone else like how do I make people an offer that I can't confuse? And the way you do that, kind of just 
jumping gears here and going into the business side of it, but you figure out who's your avatar, who's the person that's coming to your class, because it doesn't matter what you know about fitness, what you know about yoga, how you see the yoga in practice, you got to be conscious of who's in front of you. Mm. My avatar, even though I was a 24-year-old man, I knew my avatar was a 40 to 50-year-old female who had a couple of kids, was really busy, didn't have time to exercise, hadn't exercised in a couple of years, and I just built this hypothetical lady. And then I, when I was doing my marketing material, I'd always write to her. So I'd always send an email, I go, I know you don't have time to be cooking three different meals in the house. And so I've put together a free ebook, which gives you family friendly meals. I know you don't have time to be training for two hours on a treadmill. So I've got a fun 45 minute class. I know you've got questions outside of the gym and you don't want to be a pain a personal trainer 60 or an hour to ask them. That's why I put together a Facebook community where you can ask questions 24 seven and interact with other members. And so it's really getting in the head of who is the person you're trying to serve, create the package, figure out what their problems are. So maybe they don't have a social life outside of work and um, they struggle with anxiety or stress. And so you start ticking off these boxes. OK, we do our class. I also send them a 10 minute MP3 of a meditation. It's no extra work for you, mm. really, but it makes a difference for them. So. Yeah, because then the experience is just not is not just that for that hour on the mat. It's as you said, it more of a package. Mm. Um, Pat, we said we were going to do an hour and it's an hour and a half almost. So cool. any closing thoughts? I think I've said more than enough today. <laughs> um, any closing thoughts? No, I've um, I've enjoyed this. Thanks for having me. I uh, Here's a closing thought. <laughs> um, I don't know if this will make sense. Did a, a job in Qatar last year in the Middle East, a corporate job, and it was my first time working in the Middle East and I should have been confident and everything else because I'm a motivational speaker so you're supposed to be confident all the time but truth be told I spent two days in my hotel room panicked thinking how are these people going to connect to me 400 people from all over the world no one from Ireland two people from Ireland actually and I was panicked and I was thinking there's no way they're gonna you know they're gonna resonate with me most of my stories relate to me and my dad and my friends and drinking pints and growing up being an idiot you know Anyway, before I went on stage, the boss man pulled me aside and he goes, you need to understand that personal development's a privilege for the rich. And he said, what, sorry? Personal development's a privilege for the rich. And this okay. just kind of threw me. I didn't really know what he meant. Right. Then he looked at me and he goes, I presume you're not going to outdress the way you're dressed. And I was like, oh, shit. Because <laughs> I, I jump her in jeans, maybe a shirt the other time. And uh, so I got and I do this talk for 400 people. And... A bunch of them come up at the end from all over the world and they said, I really connected with some of the things you're saying. So that made me aware that we're all more similar than we are different, regardless of where we're from. We all have the same insecurities, the same fears, the same. I try to give people permission and a bit of hope that, you know, you're not the only one feeling what you're feeling. We're all feeling the same things. Just some of us hide it better than others. And hope, you know, we all need that at times. So I asked the guy afterward, what did you mean by personal development is a privilege for the rich? And he said that half of the room that I had spoken to were from the West. And so they could lean into personal development and go to the boss and say, hey, I want to raise or I want to, you know, do go on this course. I want to develop myself. And if the boss didn't like it or they didn't like it, they could throw in the towel and just go and get a different job in a different corporate. Um, he said the other half of the room come from the third world where they've come out to Qatar, this is their golden lottery ticket. They make money, they send it back to their family. They're living on next to nothing out here because all the money goes back to their family. So those people can't, you know, have the same balls to go mm. and, and, and take these chances. So he said they're surviving. So kind of took it as surviving and thriving. And any audience I ever speak to in person or any podcast I ever do, I think the people listening fall into one or two brackets. They're surviving where life is really hard at the moment and they're just trying to get by they're struggling with money or they're struggling with relationships or they're struggling with identity or they're struggling with something they're just trying to get by and then on the other side you got the people thriving where life is good everything's good they want to get that one percent they just want some entertainment or they want one little tactic that can make them a bit more money and i think it's important that we all recognize back to the wave idea some of us will thrive in life and then the following week we might survive and then we thrive and then we survive so we just got to be a bit nicer to ourselves and just look out for the people around you. So that's my little closing statement for the day. <laughs> Pat, that was an honor, a privilege. Thank you so much. And hopefully we'll do it again sometime in the future. I maybe. Gonna, I thought you were going to say, hopefully we do yoga practice. I was like, nah, <laughs> I'm done with that. <laughs> Come on, I'm now. All right. Thanks so much, Pat. Thank you, man.